Hi everyone, my name is Amy Boyd. I am a card advocate at Microsoft, specializing in AI and machine learning. And in this session, I wanna to talk to you a bit about how you can start building machine learning models faster than you think. So um, first things first, let's talk about a few resources. So number one, what I'm gonna do is actually available on GitHub and there's like a load of instructions, the data sets, etc., that you can go through and you could go ahead and build this yourself. But I also recommend taking a look at the Microsoft Learn learning path around the, t the technologies that we are gonna cover in this session. So if you go to aka.ms slash AI 900 dash no code, we are actually gonna look at a machine learning technology on Azure that is a no code option. And so I see this as a really good opportunity for those who want to start getting into machine learning. You're potentially learning about the theory alongside this. So maybe you do you know, an online sort of theory course around machine learning models. And this tool is an amazing tool to be able to start using to actually get you to the end goal a little bit quicker. And you don't have to kind of have that step into it where you have to write a lot of code. Okay, so let's dive straight in. What scenario are we gonna cover in this session? So we're actually gonna talk a bit about Tailwind Traders. Tailwind Traders are a fictitious retail company. And they think of your DIY kind of do-it-yourself store. So they sell things like um, home furniture, garden items, um, uh, tools, paint, all that kind of stuff. Now, one thing that Tailwind Traders are finding is that a lot of their stores don't necessarily have the right uh, items in them at the right time. So for example, in store one, they don't have, you know, the the items are flying off the shelves, they can't stock them quick enough, and they're completely bare, which isn't ideal, um, both in person and online. And so they want to kind of see whether there's a way to fix that. And then on the, on the other side of that coin, they also have stores across the country, across the world, that um, are actually super full and they can't move some of those items. So they can't get them out the store. They're sitting on the shelves. They want to bring in the new inventory, um, but they can't. And so the desired state for this was kind of what if we could be get better at forecasting um, sales demand and actually have a much more balanced set of items in each store. So for the store that was um, where the items were kind of flying off the shelves, we actually want to be able to make sure we can predict that and then we have shipping um, logistic items going towards them. But then also in store two, maybe not over um, adding inventory to that store and making sure there's a little bit of space so that we can put in some new items. So the Tailwind Traders team have tasked uh, their data science team um, of people who are kind of getting into the space. Uh, they're, not, they're not really, really seasoned data scientists, but they're really interested in machine learning. And so one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to go and try and solve this problem. But first things first, it's not a, um, a sort of getting you in a 101 talk unless we ask this question. So um, what is machine learning? Well, one of my favorite pieces of documentation that I really, really want you to read is this aka.ms link in the middle at the bottom. So aka.ms slash deep learning versus machine learning, all one word. Um, take a look at that article. It's written by one of my colleagues, Francesca, um, and she does a fantastic job of breaking down the categories of AI, which we've probably heard of, artificial intelligence, ML, which is machine learning, and DL, which is deep learning in this case. So let's start at the highest level. So the highest level, the umbrella level, I like to call it, is actually artificial intelligence or AI. So this is the idea that um, computers look like they're mimicking human intelligence. Um, so that they look like they're doing something intelligent. 
In fact, AI, the definition of it, tends to move. Um, so AI is nothing new. Kind of, you know, way back um, in the in the sixties, it was a term that was coined. Uh, in the 1960s, let's be more specific. And um, one of the things that's most interesting is what our expectations of what AI is as it moves on. So if you look into things like the Turing test, um, as well as as we've progressed further and further, what kind of elements sit within artificial intelligence. One item that is incredibly popular when building computers that look like they're mimicking human intelligence is actually machine learning. So machine learning tends to be a subset or a part of uh, AI solutions. So again, I see artificial intelligence personally as the full end-to-end -end architecture. How are people interacting with it? What kind of things are we doing around um, transparency? And do people know that they're interacting with a computer or a human, for example, as well as actually how are we um, surfacing this, this intelligence and how are we building it? So what data sets are we building it on? And thinking about how we, you know, connect all these different items to build an end-to-end -end, uh, recurring, always improving architecture. So if all if some projects in AI tend to have machine learning in them, what does machine learning mean? Well, machine learning, as we said, is a subset of artificial intelligence. Um, you might have heard it has many, many techniques. Uh, one of them is deep learning, which we'll cover in a minute. But actually, one of the techniques tends to be that we provide data to a computer and we tell it to improve on a task given experience. So data being experience, historical data. It will take each piece of data and it will start to learn the patterns in that data uh, that you ask it to. And then what you can do is then you can actually give it new data that's not seen before and see how well that it can actually predict the result of it. There's lots of different types of machine learning. You might have heard of things like supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, so where you don't actually tell the computer what the right or wrong answer is. You might have heard of things like reinforcement learning even. So this idea that you have a, an agent, an intelligent agent in a, in a w virtual world and how can they interact and make decisions and learn almost on the job if we want to think of it like that. So definitely, as I said, take, a, take some time to go read that article at the bottom of the page. Um, take that time to go and look into the theory around this space because it really, really helps as you're building out your projects. So deep learning is a, as we said, a subset of machine learning. So not every machine learning model has to be a deep learning model. There are typical um, areas and uh, projects that will benefit from something like deep learning. Um, but if you've ever heard of an artificial neural network, neural networks, again, were a big breakthrough in the, in the area of machine learning. And one of the things that they permit you to do is a breakthrough because instead of us kind of telling the model what features are important um, and and what actual f you know what what features we will actually provide it and then it learns the patterns between them deep learning can actually uh, build its own features and choose its own features as it's learning um, and so for things that are very very popular that people might say things such as computer vision so the ability for a, a deep learning network to actually be able to say well in my first layer um, I'm picking out you know lines and shadows and say I find a line like this and a line like this and they tend to come together, uh, the next layer will actually say, oh, we see these things frequently. Let's have this as a feature, this kind of triangular shape. And then maybe um, in the next layer, they'll say, well, actually, normally we see these two triangles in an image together. And then all of a sudden, these two triangles become the ears of a cat. So as we go further and further into the model, it can actually start building up what it sees from its experience. So as I said, there's lots and lots to learn in this space. I highly recommend taking a look at some of the documentation at the bottom of the page. I also then want to talk a little bit about um, the kind of covered from a higher level what these things do, but there is actually a, a sort of change in the way that we're approaching programming when we look at machine learning. So um, if you take a look here, traditional programming tends to be um, that we provide data 
and we provide the algorithm. So, so we know what the algorithm is. We're explicitly telling the computer exactly what it needs to do. And then what it does is it does all the computation that it needs to do, and then it will output the answer. For machine learning, it's slightly different. Instead of data, we'll still have data coming in. As we said, that data is experience, but that actually becomes something called features. So that becomes kind of the columns in your data uh, that it will start to decipher between around importance. And then we actually take the output, which is interesting, and it becomes an input. And we call that input labels. So the labels in, for example, a supervised machine learning approach tends to be the actual outcome. So say we're trying to um, predict um, true or false, um, or maybe it's in an insurance case and it's like, um, will this person claim or not claim? Claim and not claim are binary, so it's one or the other. And so what you'll do is you'll have a row of data which is the story. I always like to think that's what's actually happened in real life. And then the label actually becomes the answer. So this is what happened. These are all the details about the car or the incident and the date and etc. There are all the features. And then the label becomes, did someone claim or not claim? And can we start to learn more about that? And that algorithm is actually what comes out of a machine learning model. And we call that the model. Sorry, got there a little soon with the word model. Um, so we have data, which is features. We have um, our output, which now becomes our input and is called labels. It takes that data and those labels. It learns all the patterns and the computation. And then the computer tells us how it's actually going to build its own algorithm and that is what we call a model. So next bit, when is machine learning the right tool to use? I am by no means telling you that machine learning is the answer to everything. Um, in fact, a lot of the time, um, pure data analytics might be good enough for a problem um, and, and you know, much, much easier to manage potentially, uh, technologies that we're very, very familiar with already. Um, but there is places, a lot of places, where efficiencies and forecasting and all sorts of different approaches um, have become really, really progressed because of machine learning. Um, but one of the things I want to tell you is you always start with a question with machine learning. So not a data set, because that's the one that we tend to go to first. I've just said the data, right? That's what fuels these algorithms. That's the experience from the real world that we give to the computer. But technically, we don't want to start with that. We want to be starting with the question, what are we trying to answer that helps us with inside our business? So in our Tailwind Traders case, the question was, well, we have this problem currently. Can machine learning help us to solve it? And so once we would hone in on the problem, um, we would start to form a, a more specific question. So rather than, what do we do about the empty store? And then what do we do about the very full store? The question becomes kind of a higher level piece where we might say, okay, the approach I want to take is I'm going to set up a hypothesis. I'm going to say, what are the forecasted sales quantities per item per store for the next four weeks? So that's much more specific than just saying, here's a store and I need that full. That's the, that's the domain, that's the business problem we want to solve, but we, then we have to distill it down into an actual question. And so we said, well, actually, one of the ways that we could do that would be forecasting. If we can try and forecast better, the demand in both those stores, depending on the day, time, um, the economy, for example, we should be able to then balance our inventory better. We decided that our sales quantities um, per store were very important, so stores could be different, but also per item, different items could be more in demand than others at a certain point of time. And then we've also given it a time for forecasting. So we've said, realistically, we can potentially do some good predictions for the next four weeks of sales in each store for each item. So as I said, we've built up that question over time and that's what we're gonna solve for Tailwind Traders.
And then finally, just before we dive into a few demos and we start trying to build out our forecasting problem for our question, let's talk a bit through the modeling process. So when you build a machine learning model, um, you actually tend to only get to actually training, doing what people call the exciting bit of the model um, in one part of this bigger cycle. So what you'll see here is you can go from preparing the data, huge, huge part of um of actually building a machine learning model, so selecting it, um, understanding where your what your data estate looks like, what what data will be useful, um, applying lots of pre-processing. A lot of data now doesn't tend to be ready for machine learning modeling. It tends to be missing values, and we might have a data bias or a skew in there, um, and we might have to do a little bit of understanding of our data before we're able to actually even uh, propose a good question, a good hypothesis. When we look at training the model, what, what people deem the exciting part, that's where we might start to apply um, a specific algorithm or, or many algorithms within a specific set um, to actually help us solve a problem. Um, again, we might choose many uh, and do lots and lots of different experiments and tests. And so then we would try and select the best one out of them. From there, we want to test the model. So we train it on data, but we want to keep some data to the side so that we can actually test it on data. It's not seen before. If we test it on the same data, it's gonna get the answer right. It's seen that exact experience. We want a machine learning model to be more generalized. We don't want it to do something called overfitting, which is actually where it sort of starts to learn almost every single data point. And so when you give it something that's slightly out of that, it, it won't be able to solve the problem in the real world. Once we've tested, we then look at deployment. We're into um, a, a, a maturity, I would say, in machine learning where um, it's no longer just proof of concepts. Uh, we need to move these models into production, test them, use alpha beta testing to get feedback from your users um, and also from people, you know, do a lot of training around the deployment, um, not just building it into applications, but also how is it going to be used? How is it going to continue to learn? And so I've put a little circle um, on this model building process diagram um, because you could end up going back right back to the start and doing more data pre-processing. Uh, upgrading your model, maybe if you know some new state of the art comes out, um, retesting and redeploying and keeping that retraining cycle going. So first things first, we are going to prepare the data. Okay, so the first step we talked about on our process model was actually preparing our data, which we are going to see actually has a lot of impact on what we're even going to start with when we start building our machine learning model. So uh, first things first, a couple of things, and then I'll show you in some code kind of what that looks like. We actually need to find some data first. So we found some data where we have store ID, item ID, the time, um, so per week when the inventory is taken, um, and then also the items of the quantities, sorry, of the items sold. Um, we also validated that there's at least a year's worth of data so that we can understand full seasonality within a retail sector. So understanding what your seasonality period is. And then finally, understanding what it looks like to have any um, missing data. Now, you know, this is real, real data from a real um, business. If we have something missing, how are we going to deal with that? Um, and also, you know, do we substitute information in? Do we average it? These are all decisions that need to be made depending on the data. We're also going to add data. So we only had four items. It's going to be very, very hard to actually predict just given those four different items. So we're actually going to add in some external data that's going to help us improve our model. So one of them uh, in the retail space is the RDPI, the Retail Price Index, um, which tells you a bit about the buying power that's happening in the economy at that time. Uh, and can give you a really good sense of the, the fluctuations um, in retail buy-in depending on the time of the year um, or the economic climate. 
We're also going to look at engineering some features that are going to help us specifically with forecasting. So uh, the first one, if you're into uh, business intelligence at all, you'll know that date and time features are incredibly important when it comes to anything to do with prediction or even with uh, data science and data analytics. And so what we're going to have, we're going to add in, um, we're going to break down that time column, which was, you know, a, a date time um, all in, you know, one section to actually have year, month, week of month, uh, etc. So that we can actually understand, does it matter what the week of the month is, depending on buying habits? Do people buy a lot when they first get paid and then that last week of the month is a little bit trickier, for example? We're also going to look at seasonality and holidays. So we all know we get a little bit, um, we might overbuy sometimes when it comes up to Christmas or Valentine's Day or, um, or Easter, for example. Um, and so one of the pieces to, to kind of take into account is when these different holidays happen um, and actually how that can affect our retail forecasting predictions. Then there's two other sort of more mathematical features that can be well used for something like forecasting. So Fourier features are actually uh, a mathematical equation. They use um, sine and cos mathematics um, to actually understand and capture seasonality. So it will look at the data from previous and it will capture what seasonality looks like within your model. Um, and it's able to really understand the different changes in that seasonality. It's not just trends of up or down, but actually what does it look like on a cycle in some senses. And then finally, lag features, which are really important because you look at the prior week. The prior week is always going to affect in a real retail space what's happening this week. Um, and so to have those prior weeks and understanding with inside that, that row, that experience of information for the machine learning model, it's going to be incredibly important. So let me take you through using uh, Jupyter Notebooks and, and Python code what some of this might look like. Okay, so here we are in the Azure portal and um, one of the, so the service that we're going to be using for the majority of this demo is actually the Azure Machine Learning Service. Um, so if you go to create a new resource, find the machine learning category and then the machine learning option, you'll give it some basic information such as a name, a resource group, where you want this uh, to be located and also your subscription. But what you'll notice in here, that it's not that we do a lot of man this kind of the management piece, if you want to manage access control and private endpoints and the compute, etc. Um, this is where you'll spend that time. However, as someone who's building the models, I tend to spend most of my time in the Azure Machine Learning Studio. So if you click on the launch now button, it will actually take you to the Azure Machine Learning Service Studio, where you then have lots of great different services and different elements of your machine learning lifecycle that you can do with inside this machine learning portal. So we can see I've done some runs and I've got some computer, etc. But we're going to start right from the start. And the first thing we want to do is check in on the uh, data sets. So if I click on the, uh, you can push this uh, little icon, um, menu icon out and you can see the name. So we just went under the data sets, under assets. And one of the things under here is you can actually upload from local files, connect to data stores example to actually get some data in here. And the data that we're going to use is this forecasting data just here. And we can see we can get some information about it, but some of the interesting pieces is you can actually take a look at the data um, in this uh, in this portal. And so we can see we've got our IDs, our store ID and our item ID, time, our, our value, our retail price index, um, those date features, uh, those holiday features, our um, oops, our um, Fourier features here which are our mathematical equations of seasonality. So we can see it, seasonality and then going down to minus. And then also our lag features. And we'll see a little bit more about these shortly. You also get, um, I love this, some sample code. So how easy it is to access this from, um, from the SDK, etc. And you can also update versions, which is incredibly important at this point when we're looking at updating models. For example, we don't have to create a whole new data set and point towards something different. We can actually add a new version. 
So now I've got a data set uploaded. Another element that's very important is compute. Um, under compute, you have a couple of different items that you can use. So compute instances, I almost think of as like a developer machine. So this is a, a virtual machine, a standard D3, a, you know, a, a developer machine, if anything. Um, and what you'll notice is it says it's in running status. It's my, um, my Amy B's virtual environment. But one of the really nice things about this is it has pre-installed lots of great data science tools that can help you get started really, really quickly. You also have things like compute clusters and we'll come back to them. So these are um, what I call scalable compute. So you'll notice that uh, at the moment, no nodes are um, provisioned, but actually we have up to four or five and it actually scales it up and scales it down automatically. So you only pay for what the actual training time that you use. Really, really powerful. And then finally, inference clusters is when we start to look at deploying our models. So we might look at the Kubernetes service. Now we're going to start with our compute instances and I'm actually going to open the Jupyter um, interface. So when you click on that link, it will open uh, in, as expected, it's in my virtual environment in my Azure ML instance. So we can see recognized sort of virtual machine address there. But actually, this is a full Jupyter environment where um, I can get started. If you've not used Jupyter before, it's a very, very popular um, tool for data scientists when you're coding in Python. And it's actually something called a notebooks format. And what notebooks means is that you can open these IPython notebooks, IPYMB files, and you can actually run and um, kind of in, um, interact with the code really, really easily and print it out. So uh, this is our notebook. And what we're going to do here is we're going to show you some of the pre-processing. So we're going to import some packages, including uh, specifically US holidays. We're going to get our data, so our forecasting data, which is sitting just here, but we could also get this from our Azure Data Store. We're going to pull it into um, a data frame in Python, and then we're just going to take a look um, at the actual data frame. So we can see here, just like the data we saw in the um, prior example in the data sets, uh, I can also take a look at the tail. So the tail, the head is the first five rows, the tail is the bottom five rows. Uh, we can see we've got five rows and 47 different columns here. Uh, and in these ones, I just want to show you that the lag features are then all available there. Um, whereas there were all zeros at the top. Okay. Um, so that's our data, and now we're going to start doing some pre-processing. So first things first, I'm going to filter just down to um, one store, so store two and uh, item one. So we can actually start selecting from this data frame anything where ID one has uh, a number two and anything where ID two has a number one. Uh, and we can see there that we can see that it's filtered. Now we're going to start um, creating our uh, new four weeks ahead. So we've got all the historical data all sorted, right? We've got all the values ready for that. But actually what we want to do is we want to do the future four weeks. So we're going to um, get the time column and sort it. We're going to get the last date from that data frame, which was um, the second of January in this case. And then actually what we're going to do is we're going to add uh, the next four weeks uh, into this data frame with some basic data. We can then add to this our lag features. So what's happened for the previous 26 weeks. So we can see there now in there as the lag features. Uh, but we've got some missing data here. That's okay because we're actually going to create our time features now. So we're going to say, okay, add, um, take the time and get the year from it. Take the time and get the month from it. Get the time and get the day, the week of the month from it. So applying a little bit of rounding here and then also get the week of the year. And then if we print that, what we can see is that we can get um, some dates here and it's broken out the year, the week of the month and the week of the year. We can also um, add in our binary features. So or is this a holiday? Is it Black Friday? Is it Christmas Day? Is it New Year's Day, for example? And we can actually add that to the data. 
so we can see there that actually all of these are false but at least they're false now and not put in as not a number and then finally our Fourier feature so the ability for it to understand the seasonality of the data um, these are uh, well-known sort of mathematical uh, equations you'll be able to look this kind of thing up uh, very very easily and we can cycle through them and we can see that we've now got our Fourier features as well if I uh, list out sorry if I take off the length there we can see all the different columns as we expected, the lag features, the frequency features. So for saying we just started with these four features, we actually added so many more. So this is called feature engineering and is incredibly important in machine learning. So now I feel like we've got our data set and we're pretty much uh, ready to pop it into a dictionary. Um, and what we're going to do is we're actually going to use some of that historical data to predict uh, and see if we can build a forecasting model. Okay, so we have done our preparation of data and so now we can move around our model building process diagram and we're actually going to move into what people deem the exciting bit, which is actually training the model and building experiments that are going to allow us to understand um, if we can build a good forecasting model using this data. Okay, so we are out of our notebook and back into our studio interface. And this is where we know we've got our data set ready. We've got some compute and we'll talk a little bit more about that when the experiment is running. But one of the things we're going to use now is a service as a part of the Azure Machine Learning Service. And that is our designer service, our no code, low code option for building machine learning models. So if you click on designer under the author section, uh, you'll see I've got some uh, previously run and built experiments. Uh, just below. We can also pick up some templates if we want to build off uh, a specific type of recommendation or um, some of the image classification which is really exciting now that's in Azure Machine Learning Designer but we're going to create um, a new blank experiment. So I'm going to give this a name, uh, Tailwind Traders uh, Forecasting. And one of the things you'll notice here is I've got a bit of a, a red um, warning sign. Well, warnings are never good. So what we've got to do is we've got to actually attach a compute target. So a place where we will say, go and submit my experiment that I build here onto some very specific compute that I've created. Now under my compute tab, I talked a little bit about scalable compute. Um, and that's actually what, what I'm going to use here. So I'm going to select my compute target. And we can see it comes up with some things. So it comes up with my uh, virtual machine that I was running my notebook from. But what I'm actually going to use is my um, CPU compute. So it's a training cluster of four different nodes um, of virtual machines that can actually get this work and divvy them between them and run through our uh, example. So I'll select that and click save. And then it'll always tell me what compute I'm running on here as well. So first things first, we're going to grab a data set. So we know that we updated, up, upgrade, um, uploaded our data set. And what I can do is I can simply click on the data set, drag it onto the surface. I can click on outputs and actually view this data as well, just to double check I've got the right data set. And we can see I've got my 47 columns. I've got uh, around 2,500 rows of data and I've got all of that great data that we feature engineered in our pre-processing stage. So this is what we're gonna work with. So that was the data sets category, but there's all lots and lots of great different categories that we're gonna use here. So first things first, we're gonna do data transformation. And I'm actually gonna remove the time feature from our uh, forecast because it's a it's actually a unique variable, right? It's a, a unique value in every single case. Um, and it's very important that we actually want it to find patterns uh, and not specific um, sort of values that it's seen before. And so one of the things I'm going to do is to select columns in data set. And what I'm literally doing uh, is I can just build up and connect my diagram like a flow chart. So I'm going to say, take this forecasting data, put it into this process where I'm going to ask it to, um, by name, I'm going to add all my columns, but I'm going to remove the time column. So I'm going to keep 46 columns moving forwards. 
Great stuff. So I've already done my pre-processing elsewhere, so I don't need to do any data from more data transformation right now. So what I'm actually going to do is I can actually search up here as well for all the different items. So I can type in split and it's going to come up with my split data module. So I'm going to connect that up. Uh, why am I splitting data? In machine learning, you use training and testing data. I briefly spoke about the fact that we don't want to train and test our algorithm on the same data. We actually want to train it on one set and then see how well it generalizes on another. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put 70% of my data into this first output port here. And then I'm going to put 30% into this output port here. So this one will be training data and this one will be testing data. Okay, so I've split my data ready for training and testing. And now what I'm going to do is select one of my algorithms. So we can see there's a load of great built-in machine learning algorithms. We are actually predicting the inventory value uh, depending on the, the, the forecast. And so that is actually a regression experiment. Uh, how much or how many items uh, are we predicting? And so what I'm going to do, I can click and drag and I can move this about so I've got some more space. I'm going to bring on a boosted decision tree regression. I'm often very good at segmenting data, um, a very, very well used algorithm. There is also a great Azure machine learning cheat sheet and I'll give you a link to that after this demo. So we have our algorithm and if I hover over this port just here, one of the things that you'll see is it says it's an untrained model. So I think of this as it's just an algorithm. The way we build a model is by bringing in together an, an algorithm or an, a mathematical equation and approach and some data. So we're going to take our algorithm and our training data just here, and we're actually going to connect these together using, if we go into the model training category, the train model option. So I can connect, if you hover over any of these input ports, especially when there's two and it's maybe a little confusing as to what we need to connect, we can see this one is an untrained model and this one is an untrained model. So I can select and then what we'll do is we'll connect that and we'll connect it to the data set. Under train model, the thing that we need to tell it is actually which label outcome column we want it to train on. So we're providing it all this data and it's a supervised regression problem. So we need to actually provide it the, the answer. And the answer in our case is actually in the value column. So we'll click save. Next up, we take the algorithm, we use our training data to train the model. At the bottom of that, we get a trained model. And so then uh, what we want to do is if I type in here score, we can see that I can choose the score model option, bring it onto the table. So the score model takes a trained model, which is this one, and it takes the data set, which is actually our testing data set. So uh, here, if we look at this, we can actually visually see that the model is trained on one set of data and tested on data that does not go near the training process. That's really, really important. And then finally, uh, we want to evaluate. So there's lots of great metrics in machine learning that we use to evaluate how good our model is. Now I always think of it like a bit of a card game. So in score model, we basically say, okay, here's the real label because this is all still historical data. So we know the answer. Um, here's the real value. What did you predict? And then we basically measure the difference or the error between those different things. So once we're happy with that, uh, we can actually then click submit. Once we click submit, this is basically saying, okay, now I want to go run that experiment and put it on a form of compute. So I'm actually going to create a new experiment. I'm going to call it Tailwind Traders uh, Forecasting. And I, it says, right, you've already selected your default compute target. And I click submit. It will go off submit this experiment, run it on that compute, and then come back to me once it's finished. We can see it now says running, and in a short moment, we'll start to see it run through the experiment. So we can see here, this one is now queued, and it will start to run, and then once it's run, these little edges will turn green as it moves its way down the experiment. Now, whilst we're waiting, we can always come back to this one. Uh, here's one I made earlier. So if I go to my forecasting sales, we can see that once it's run, it has um, 
this green icon. Uh, we can also look at any part. So for example, in the score model module, we can look at any of the outputs by visualizing the data. So we can see we've got 47 columns, which is what we started with, but we took out the value. And actually, if we go all the way to the end, one thing we'll see is there's now this new column called scored labels. And this is actually the predictions that the model has made that can be compared to uh, the actual value column over here. Now to make that a bit easier, what, we, what I've done is I've added some extra um, data processing here. But first things first, I want to quickly show you the evaluate module as well. So if we go into evaluate and view the results, as I mentioned, we're actually looking for the error rate um, that goes between. So every time we get a data point, we measure the distance between the actual uh, true value and the value that our model has predicted. And then we sum them all up and we average across the error and then we get a value. We want this as close to zero as possible to be a really performant model. So it's not too bad, but what we want to do is look at the actual data a little bit better. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that scored model, uh, scored labels, sorry, column, and we're going to edit the metadata. And I'm going to take the scored labels column and change it to the name forecast so that I understand what that is. So that is actually the forecast um, of what we're predicting. You'll notice I'm applying a math operation exponential on our value and our forecast. That's because in the pre-processing, one of the things I did was actually normalize the data. Normalizing the data is a really, really um, popular uh, thing with inside machine learning when you're doing pre-processing. It basically makes sure that our data values are not wildly apart, you know, far apart from each other. And it brings them down to a much smaller range so that mathematics can be applied to them very, very quickly. It's, it's an efficiency piece um, in, in, one, in one instance. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply the exponential to get my um, real values back, so the actual items of inventory. I'm going to apply it to my value on my forecast. I'm actually going to put it in place of the columns that were in the previous set. So if we're going to edit metadata and look at the outputs. You'll see that value is like 4.86 and, and forecast now is 5.16. That's we don't. It, that doesn't mean we want five items in that store. What it actually means is when we apply this math operation and we look at the output, is the value is actually in the hundreds. Um, but you'll see these values are quite significantly different from each other. So the the first value is 130, uh, and we forecasted 175. And then finally, um, I actually don't want to output all of those forer features and lag features and all of that. I want to have a really tidy data set so I can very closely compare how well it's actually predicting um, depending on uh, the, the different IDs, so the store ID and the item ID. This is um, obviously just one experiment so far. Um, we've done one algorithm, so we might want to try out uh, some of the other algorithms that are available to us to, to uh, experiment with them, see if they give us a better approach. We might want to even look at things like hyperparameter tuning. We might want to select different columns and different features in our data set. Um, we might also want to actually look at how we're... Um, what kind of split of data or what kind of um, segmentation of data we've got going on in there as well. So there's lots of great steps after this kind of initial experiment that you'll find yourself doing many, many different experiments. But in this case, what we've done is we've created a model on our forecasting data, a regression model that actually forecasts, oops, that actually forecasts the value for each item in each store. Okay, so in that part of the demo, we actually trained and built a forecasting model based on our pre-processed data. And now we are happy with the model that we have built. However, I want to give you um, a little bit of extra resources that can help you in building your own machine learning models moving forwards. And that is in this cheat sheet here. So if you go to aka.ms slash ML cheat sheet. Uh, that is where you can get this really, really useful item. So 
So we have prepared our data, we have trained our data, and so the last couple of steps is to actually test and deploy. So we did our testing set and we looked at our output, but now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at deploying the model and what that looks like in the Azure Machine Learning Designer. Okay, so here is the experiment that we ran earlier and created. And what you'll notice is once you run through this is um, this, these items will pop up. So uh, we've already created one, so ignore this for now, but it, what comes up is create inference pipeline. And inference basically means we're no longer training the model. We actually want to design this model uh, to be built into an API that we can send new data to and send back um, API or HTTP requests with data from our bespoke model. So if we drop down and we selected real-time inference pipeline, we could actually create a new experiment. So here's one that I created earlier. And what it will do is it will look very slightly different than what it did in the past. So you can see we've still got our forecasting data, but it's also added this web service input. And so this is where you think about where your application or your user sends data to. This is your API endpoint. So what does the data look like at this point? Well, it looks like the schema of the forecasting data that then goes into our actual um, model. You'll also notice that the um, algorithm, train model, etc., splitting of the data has also disappeared. That's all been merged into this element here, which is actually one of our trained models now. Um, and this is the combination of a, a boosted decision tree, our forecasting data, and our data split uh, that is actually in there. And what we now do is we pass that model to the score module so we say one row of data for example from our end user will come in we'll take out the time column still then we'll pass it to our score model where we'll run our our trained algorithm on that one piece of data then instead of evaluating a larger output we're actually going to send it down this example here and that what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, send it down through our edit metadata so where we uh, called it our forecasting where we applied the exponential to it and where we just selected the items that we wanted back and so now that schema of just four columns is where the web service output will be sent so then you can think of okay if we send in uh, all the different values from the front end application what we actually send out is quite different we only want to send back what we really need to which is um, the actual prediction for that store um, and that item at that time so once we've got this, uh, you can notice you, you have to have it run through completely. So here we can see it's got all of our green markers by it. So make sure you've got that before you move on. And then you can click the deploy button. You can create a real time endpoint or you can replace an existing one that exists. But what we're going to do is we're going to call have our, um, we'll call this Tailwind Traders um, forecasting deploy. We can see that I actually have my Azure Kubernetes service that we saw at the start ready for deployment. So this deploy v3 that's in the West Europe region. And so what I'm saying is I want to put this model, this API, I want it to be built and run on my Azure Kubernetes service. And so I'll click deploy. This will actually go off and prepare to deploy. And then what we can do is we can go to our endpoints just here. We can see here's one we made earlier where we can see the service ID, it's in a healthy state, who it was created by, what model it's based on, so our saved model, as well as things like actually where can we access this, right? This has now become sort of an application developer uh, um, task in the sense that we're now calling off to an API with a set of data, our Swagger URI. It's very, very helpful for that. Um, if you copy and paste this into something like Visual Studio Code and format it, it's a really, really great way to actually see um, the a set of example data um, of what your API call will look like. You can also see if we uh, go into test is you can actually 
test this endpoint with some sample data from right inside the portal or you can actually consume it so it's got both the rest endpoint as well as the keys um, ready for you to use and one of my favorite parts is some sample code in c-sharp python and r some very popular languages in the machine learning space and what you'll notice is some of our data is already pre-populated in here but obviously do go ahead and edit this but this is actually built in your API as well as your key. It's just kind of showing you a little bit here that these endpoints are all part still of the Azure Machine Learning Studio. This is where you can build them. This is where you can manage them. But it really then is an end to end lifecycle. So first things first, um, if you want to get all of that um, sample code that's on GitHub and kind of the step by step of what I've built there, you can go to aka.ms slash AIML30 repo. However, I would also highly recommend you seen me do this specific example, but I want you to learn about lots of different examples. And we have a great set of resources, a whole learning path actually on Azure Machine Learning Designer um, on Microsoft Learn. If you've not used Microsoft Learn before, for. It's a um, hands-on, free um, online learning platform where you can learn about um, Azure and actually more broadly Microsoft technologies. So if you go to aka.ms slash AI900 dash no code, uh, which you'll see actually on all of the slides uh, that, that are in this session, uh, I highly recommend going there to take your next steps to learning even more about this platform. Uh, now, hopefully that you're inspired to learn more. And also just let you know that the Azure Machine Learning Designer is actually part of the Azure AI Fundamental Certification. Highly recommend taking a look into this. It's a great broad approach to the Azure AI platform and what you can do with AI technologies and, and what kind of what, what technology suits what problem. If you want to find out more about that, you can go to aka.ms AI 900 LP and that will actually take you to the certification page with all of the Microsoft Learn modules that you need to go through at the bottom of the page. So with that, I just want to say a huge thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, please let me know.